Praise the Lord for Mondays, huh? Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we are thankful this morning for your uh, blessings upon our lives. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful weekend that we've had, good services yesterday. Thank you, Father, for those that put their faith and trust in you these last few days. We pray that you'll bless now as we start this new week. Father, may we honor you in everything that we do. We pray that you'll bless now in this class session this morning, that you'll direct our thoughts as we study your word together. Father, bless the students as they prepare for the test on Friday, and we pray, Lord, that you'll help them to do well at that time. Father, we thank you for uh, your love and mercy to us. Bless now during this time. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'll remind you of our schedule for the week now. We'll be doing this week's memory work assignment, which is already week number 11 on your list. Um, for on Wednesday, that's two verses, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, and John chapter 8, verse 58. Matthew 1, 23, and John 8, 58. You'll find both those verses to be familiar, I'm sure, once you get into them, if you're not familiar with the references. Also, of course, we'll do the test over the Doctrine of the Trinity material on Friday. We reviewed that the other day, of course, as you'll recall, so uh, you should be in good stead on that material. As I've said, we have had uh, two tests up to this point in time. Most of you have been doing pretty well on those. This will be your third one. The last one will, of course, be your final exam. And we were just looking at the calendar this morning. We've got four, four weeks of classes uh, remaining starting this morning, and, uh, and then, of course, the fifth week will be final exam week, so blink your eyes a couple times, and it'll be here, I'm telling you, so coming on fast and furious, but, uh, but we do want to we do want to stay focused on, on what we need to accomplish, of course. Remember, again, you've got a workbook assignment coming due on May the 4th. That's two weeks from this Friday, if I remember the calendar properly, so uh, again, that's... Uh, coming around here pretty quick and I'm sure you've got other blessings coming due in most of your other classes as well so I encourage you to get on top of that instead of letting it pile up on you amen all right let's go back open our Bibles again to 1st Corinthians chapter 6 and we'll pick up where we left off on Friday our primary focus here of course is as we have said the the doctrine of Jesus Christ, we're talking about those to whom Christ is precious in our last session, and uh, we started out with, of course, the sacred writers, and uh, how many of you have ever had someone tell you that they don't believe the Bible because man wrote wrote the Bible, you know, that's something you hear all the time out soul winning, isn't it, and uh, the truth of scripture is that, the, is that God, of course, uh, chooses to use, to use people, God chooses to use people human instruments, and uh, that, that's, that's why we're here today, amen, uh, to be trained to be used of the Lord, but the scripture clearly tells us that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, amen, and so the, the sacred writers, as we said, considered Christ as the all in all of their religion, and as such, they loved him with their whole hearts, he was at the, the center of their hearts, the center of their faith, the center of their thoughts and words. And so our, our primary thought that we're going to deal with in class this morning is the one that we began on Friday, I guess it was, that all the great doctrines of God's Word center in Christ. And, uh, and, and of course, we, it begins with the, the statement that we quoted the other day about the truth. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so all truth, all truth is grounded and centered in Christ. And as we relate that, of course, to the Scripture, we'll find, of course, that, that the passages that are particularly doctrinal in nature are filled with references to Christ, as we see in this passage that we'll deal with this morning. And so the underlying premise to our discussion today is what we talked about on Friday, that all truth, all the great doctrines of the Bible, center in Christ. You remove Christ from the center of these doctrines, and, and they fall apart. Now, let's consider some examples. We'll start with this one here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Remember, again, uh, the setting. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, the church that he had founded, a church that, uh, of course, that, that he had founded on, on his missionary journeys, and he traveled beyond that, of course, to other places, being used of the Lord. And so now he's been, uh, been apprised of the fact that there are some concerns, some problems. Uh, 
uh, in this church, and, and so he writes the letters of First and Second Corinthians to them, and uh, and and in this first uh, book, this first letter, the letter of First Corinthians, he deals with some of the problems, some of the concerns, some of the things that were going on in the church, starting with the we talked about the other day, starting with the divisions in the church, how the people were putting their focus upon people, on preachers, and not so much so upon the Lord himself. And, uh, and, and he reminds them, of course, of what God had done for them in, in this matter of salvation. <clears throat> and um, sometimes you think about it like this. Sometimes the devil is, well, not sometimes, all the time, the devil is relentless when it comes to trying to undermine the work of God, trying to oppose the people of God, trying to hinder the work, uh, of course, the, the work of the Lord through the local church. And, and there are, are often times, of course, that, that people are fearful uh, to step out on faith and, and simply go, the next, go to the next level, so to speak, in their Christian life because they think, you know, I'm not qualified, I can't do that, uh, you know, because of their past or whatever. Uh, uh, the Bible makes it very clear, you know, that when a person gets saved, that, you know, that he's a new creature in Christ. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, as you get into the ministry, uh, you, will be, you will be asked, and maybe not even asked, you'll just simply be told to do a lot of things that you don't think you're qualified to do. But, uh, you know, that's part of the ministry. It's, it's just... You know, putting yourself in a position to where God will enable you to do what needs to be done. You will not find a single place in the scripture that God called a man to do anything that God did not equip him. And God did not enable him to do the job that he had called him to do. And the same thing's true for God's people today. And so these folks here in, in the church of Corinth, uh, Paul reminds them of what the Lord had brought them from. And, and how the Lord had saved their souls and how the Lord had put them, of course, on the, on the road to heaven and in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. And so the key verse here is verse number 11. He mentions all these things in the previous verses that some of these folks had been a part of in their previous life before they came to know Christ as their Savior. And some pretty uh, uh, ungodly things are mentioned in those verses. But he says... Uh, he says this to them, and the same thing could be said of, of many of God's people today, uh, and such were some of you, verse 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When I read that verse, I often remember a, a saying that I heard some time ago, still see it occasionally, uh, like on a bumper sticker or something like that on a car, and it goes something like this, that... Uh, you know, every time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen? Amen. That works for me. Amen? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the idea is that, you know, you're different now. You're changed. You've been transformed. You're saved. And such were some of you. Now, I want you to notice, again, we're coming back to our basic thought that all truth, all doctrinal truth is grounded and centered in Jesus Christ. Notice in this verse alone, that uh, there are at least three major doctrines that just kind of jump off the page at us here and uh, in, in, this, in this one verse. Three major doctrines, Bible doctrines that are singled out and of course each one is centered in Christ. The first one, and you want to write this down, I'll give you a definition of these. I'm going to give you four or five or six of these, I guess, before we're finished here. The first one, number one on your list is regeneration. Regeneration. Now, I'll give you a little hint. I'm going to define each of these terms today. And uh, a little bit later in the month of May, you're going to reproduce this for me on a test. Amen? So get this down. What is regeneration? Regeneration. Let me give you a, a good definition, a good workable definition of this doctrine. Here it is. Regeneration is that special work of the Holy Spirit, that special work of the Holy Spirit whereby he makes the believer that special work of the Holy Spirit whereby he makes the believer a partaker of the divine nature that special work of the Holy Spirit whereby he makes the believer a partaker of the divine nature 
by the miraculous creation of a new heart within. That special work of the Holy Spirit whereby he makes the believer a partaker of the divine nature by the miraculous creation of a new heart within. So what we're talking about, of course, is salvation, isn't it? You'll recall that this new creation is so special, so transforming, so life-changing that Christ spoke of it in John chapter 3 and verse 3 as being what? Being born again. And uh, Paul speaks of it, of course, in the verse that we already referred to this morning, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, as becoming a new creature. Look, if you will, uh, hold your place here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Ephesians chapter 2. Here, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's dealing with this same doctrinal truth as to what the Lord has done in our hearts and in our lives the moment that we trusted Christ as our Savior and became saved. He says in, in, in this letter to the church of Ephesus in chapter 2 and in verse number 1, and you hath he quickened. That's talking about being brought to life, isn't it? Remember what the Bible says about the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is what? Quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. What's that mean? It means it's alive. It means it's the living Word of God. Here we're talking about salvation. We're talking about regeneration. And you hath he quickened, you hath he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, before a person trusts Christ as their Savior, that is their epitaph, so to speak. That is their testimony, if you want to say that. They're dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein, verse 2, in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world. Now that same statement applies to what he told the church of Corinth. And such were some of you. Remember that one? All right. So... We're in a time past, before you got saved, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? That's the, that's the devil. That's our adversary, our enemy, the devil. We're in a time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Let's read on. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. Now when the scripture uses that word conversation here, when we use that word today in our modern vernacular, we're talking about, you know, talking with each other, having a conversation, one with another, conversing one with another. Well, it's talking about that, but it means more than that in the scripture. It, it's talking about a lifestyle. It's talking about the way you live your life. So among whom also, in the devil in other words, we also, we all had our conversation, our lifestyle, if you will, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. As you notice the, the connotation there in the latter part of verse 2 and again at the end of verse 3, it talks about the children of disobedience. It talks about the children of, uh, the children of wrath. In, in, uh, in verse number 3. That's, uh, that's what the Lord saved us from. Amen. That's what the Lord brought us from. And uh, I'm glad that that verse doesn't stop there because verse number 4 is a fantastic reference. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are, uh, ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All right, so regeneration. It's, uh, it's, it's talking about becoming a new creature, talking about being born again, talking about getting saved. It's sometimes referred to in the scripture as a, as a washing, a washing by the blood or a washing by the word. Now, go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11. And notice again what he says here. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All right, we also see in this, in this particular verse, this is number two on your list, 
we see the doctrine of justification. All right, put it down, justification. And let me give you a definition for that wonderful doctrinal truth in the scripture. Justification. Justification means to make innocent and to declare righteous. Write it down. Just justification, to make innocent and to declare righteous. Make innocent and to declare righteous. All right, now let me give you a, an additional thought on that. Justification is God's declaration. Justification is God's declaration that those who trust Jesus Christ are perfectly righteous before Him. Justification is God's declaration that those who trust Jesus Christ are perfectly righteous before Him. All right, justification, to make innocent and to declare righteous. It's God's declaration that those who trust Jesus Christ are perfectly righteous before him. The word justify, justify uh, is a, a legal term or concept as when a judge gives a verdict. God, of course, is the great judge, isn't he? And it is his law that we have broken as sinners. And before we are saved, God declares that we are condemned sinners. After we come to Christ, God declares that we are righteous because of, we're so, such good people. Is that why he does that? No. Uh, because of what Christ did for us on Calvary. Justification, here's the last statement you need to add to your little definition there. Justification is being brought into a new spiritual position before God. Justification is being brought into a new spiritual position before God. Now let's look at some references together. You get all that down. Justification is being brought into a new spiritual position before God. Hold your place there in 1 Corinthians. Let's go back to Romans. Uh, let's start in Romans chapter 5. This is probably about the classic reference, I think, on the thought on the doctrine of justification that, that comes to mind readily to me this morning anyway. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at two or three references here out of the book of Romans. We'll start with... Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul says these wonderful words here. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That's our standing in Christ today. That's our position in Christ. When the Lord looks at us, what does he see? He sees the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the last few verses of the previous chapter deal with, uh, as you see there in the latter part of chapter 4. So by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and, we, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now let's back up and look at those last few verses of chapter 4 while we're here talking, uh, if you'll back up to about verse 19, 20, 21, it's talking about the faith of Abraham and uh, how that Abraham, of course, believed God. Look at verse number uh, 19, Romans 4, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he, Abraham, considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered 
for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. While we're here, look over in chapter 6 with me. Let me just pull one verse out of chapter 6 that's a blessing uh, in this discussion as well. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse number 17. But God be thanked. Well, that's a pretty good sermon topic right there by itself, isn't it? You can work on that for a while and come up with a good one, I'm sure. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. That's our past life. That's our former conversation that Paul wrote about. God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Past tense, amen? What a blessing. That ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed, notice now, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Turn on TV today, you turn on religious so-called TV today, and you'll hear the basic idea that it doesn't really matter what you believe. Well, it does matter what you believe. And uh, whether or not you're going to live eternally in heaven or hell matters as to what you believe. And uh, Paul tells, the, tells the, the Romans here, he says, uh, God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, <coughs> Excuse me, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. It is important what you believe. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. I quote this verse quite often. This is a, one of my favorite verses. I've only got about 3,000 of them, amen. But uh, this is tremendous right here. Romans chapter 8 talks about the same thing, about our former life before we came to know Christ and where we stand today. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you again what I've said before. Anyone that cannot read eternal salvation, what we often refer to as eternal security, into that verse, I'm going to tell you, just simply cannot read. They've got a reading comprehension problem, amen? There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, you've been regenerated, you've been saved, you've been born again, amen? And, uh, and, and so... When God sees us, as we've seen this morning, he sees the imputed righteousness of Christ. There is no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll pull one more, one more thought out of this verse. We skipped over it, but in the midst of that verse, you have the word sanctified, don't you? And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified sanctified. All right, that's number three on your list, the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification. Now, we've dealt with that thought before earlier this semester <clears throat> when we studied it uh, somewhat from the, uh, in relation to the doctrine of holiness. And so we'll touch on that a little bit and perhaps enlarge on it somewhat at this point. The doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification, as you'll recall, literally means to be set apart for a sacred purpose. There's your definition. Sanctification. To be set apart for a sacred purpose. To be set apart for a sacred purpose. As I said, we studied this somewhat when we studied the doctrine of holiness. You'll remember that the scriptures teach uh, essentially two aspects of sanctification positional sanctification that's salvation being born again uh, and so forth and daily sanctification or what we would call practical or progressive sanctification that doesn't mean that we're getting becoming more and more holy so we can be saved no we're either saved or we're lost amen but it's talking about being holy in our daily living being close to the Lord and so believers receive an, an eternal unchangeable position of sanctification at the moment of salvation and that will never change our practical or progressive sanctification as we said is our daily growth our, our, our daily uh, growth in holiness and spiritual maturity that begins at the moment of salvation and continues all throughout our, our lives our Christian lives sanctification means to be set apart for a sacred purpose. 
sometimes I think we look at words like that and we just really don't get it, you know. We really don't understand or, or comprehend what that word is saying to us and how important that word and that doctrine is to God and how important it ought to be to you and to me. Now, I'm going to say something that you've heard said many, many times before, I'm sure, but let's kind of bring this back to home and apply it in a personal way this morning. Sanctification means to be set apart for a sacred purpose. Now, I think that applies to a lot of areas of life. I think it applies to how we ought to live our lives. I think it applies to, uh, you know, what we ought to be a part of and where we ought to draw the line in relation to standards and, 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 and all that sort of business. And uh, that which we would uh, tolerate, and that's which, that which we would never tolerate under any circumstance in our homes, in our lives, in our families, and so forth. Uh, I think it also applies in a, in a larger sense to our life itself. I don't know about you, but I want my life to be set apart unto God for a sacred purpose. Amen? And I hope that you have that same desire. But uh, sometimes we sell out to the world, sometimes we sell out to the devil so cheaply compared to what God really, truly wants to do with us and in our lives. And uh, when we say, we say that sanctification needs to be set apart for a sacred purpose, I, I believe this. I believe that God has a perfect plan for my life. I believe God has a perfect plan for your life, for the life of every believer. And uh, I also believe that the devil's got a plan for us. Amen? And so it's who we're listening to and who we're tuned into today that kind of determines how we're doing with that, that business, this business of being set apart for a sacred purpose. And uh, if we're not careful, we can uh, give in to the, uh, to the desires of the flesh that Paul warns us about, even in some of the scriptures we've, we've dealt with this morning. And we can be focused upon earthly things, not necessarily ungodly, evil, wicked, inherently terrible things, but just not the best things that God would have for us. Amen? And, uh, you know, if, if uh, I know Dr. Brown's out of town this morning, and I think he's preaching in a chapel in a Christian school down in South Florida, if I remember right. And so uh, there may have been a day of reckoning later on, but I bet you I probably could have hooked up the boat this morning and been out on the holy water serving God right now. Amen? And I probably could have got by with that, you know, to some extent, but uh, maybe not either. You never know. But uh, it's kind of like the, the the pastor who, you know, heard that one of his deacons was on the side of the of the river <coughs> fishing Sunday morning, and not in church, and so he confronted him about it the next time he saw him. And he said, "What's the deal?" He said, I, "I was told that you were fishing Sunday morning instead of being in church where you're supposed to be." And the deacon said, well, preacher, I couldn't have come anyway. My wife was home sick that day, man. So, so uh, you know how that works sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> I could have been out serving the Lord on the holy waters this morning. Is that necessarily evil, wicked, or ungodly? No. It would have been if I lied about it, if I was deceitful, perhaps. But that's not necessarily such a bad thing. In fact, that's really a pretty good thing. But, uh, but it's not the best thing, Amen. What's the best thing? The best thing is for me to be here tormenting you. That's the perfect will of God for my life, amen? And, uh, and I'm pretty good at doing that, amen? But uh, the Lord enables a man to do the job he's called him to do, all right? But seriously, we can get involved in things that are not necessarily all that bad, but they're not the best that God has in store for us. And, uh, and that's true all over the place in, 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 in Christian lives. And... Uh, God has a perfect plan for our lives. God also has, we sometimes say, well, God also has a permissive plan. I don't know about all that, but uh, I do know this. I do know that you can choose to do what you want to do in life, and God will let you. Better be careful what you wish for sometimes, though. Amen? And, uh, and, and so if there is a permissive will with God, then that would be whatever God will let you get away with without killing you. That's the way I look at that anyway. And I take that pretty serious. I want to be on the Lord's good side, not on the, on the other side. Amen. But uh, a lot of times we, we settle for something in between those two. And, uh, and so I wanted to kind of bring that back to that focus this morning. Uh, because sometimes we see those words like sanctified, sanctification, justification, and so forth, and they just kind of, you know, 
go in one ear and out the other without us really thinking that through. And uh, that's a very serious matter. You know, uh, go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, while we're on this thought this morning. I've told you before, when I surrendered my life to the Lord uh, back in my late teens, uh, and of course uh, within just a, a few months' time I was in Bible college, uh, being trained to serve the Lord in a full-time way. <clears throat> but uh, when I walked the aisle, and I, and I uh, actually even prior to that time, I got home one afternoon, I was in school, I was in college at the time, and I was in classes in the mornings and the afternoons. I was uh, either at work or at home, and uh, I worked some afternoons, some evenings, that type of a schedule. So I, got, I was still living at home with my parents, of course, at that time before I left home to go to Bible college in another state. And, and of course, I, I got home that afternoon. Nobody was in the house, and so I sat down in the living room, and I got my Bible out, and the Lord was really dealing with my, with my heart about full-time surrender. And as I've told you before, up to that point in time, I was always serious about serving the Lord. I just needed some direction in my life, that's for sure. And thank the Lord I had some people in my, in my church family that provided that spiritual uh, compass in my, in my life. That was uh, something that I wasn't getting at home, that's for sure. But uh, I was talking with somebody yesterday, and we were, uh, I guess it was on the, on the bus route yesterday. I was driving a bus yesterday afternoon. Um, couple drivers that needed some help so uh, brother Fuller and I were talking on the way back on the bus route we were talking about family and so forth and, uh, he was talking about how that as a youngster uh, he was never encouraged to go to church and if anything he was discouraged from going to church and I told him I said I never got any uh, any discouragement about it I said I wasn't necessarily all that encouraged to go I said but thank the Lord my, my dad especially never opposed my brothers and I going to church and, and my mom finally became pretty faithful in church too uh, a little bit later on in life but uh, you know I said I said you know it never was a problem with my dad until the day I told him I was going to Bible college and it became a big problem he had a fit over that but uh, that's another story for another time but I, I got down on my knees that day in the living room of my parents home and I fully surrendered my heart my life to the Lord and I told the Lord you take Help me to take my hands off my life. You put your hands on my life. You do with me what you will and direct me uh, as to where you would have me go and so on and so forth. And that's been happening in my life ever since, of course. And uh, I got up off my knees and I got in my car, drove across town. And the first guy I talked to that I wanted to share that decision with was the fellow who had led me to Christ. And he was a man in our church. and and. Uh, and he, was, uh, he, he, he uh, worked at a car, car dealership, big car dealership across town. So I drove over and went to his office, and, and we were able to go to a little restaurant next door there and sit down for a little bit. And, uh, and I told him about the decision I had made, and he, of course, encouraged me. And uh, the next service that we had at church, I walked the aisle, and I told the pastor and the people of the church you know, about my decision. And uh, the pastor had me, uh, had one of the men in the church, one of our youth leaders, a man that I had a lot of trust in in those days, uh, pray with me there at the altar. And he turned in the scriptures to this, verse, to this passage right here. He, says, he, he said to me, he said, Phil, what you're talking about this morning is a very, uh, a very serious decision for the Lord. And uh, because you're not just talking about you know, something that you may or may not do. You're talking about something concerning the entire rest of your life. And he says, I'm proud that you're making this decision, but I want you to understand how serious this is. And he came to this passage. You know the verses, I'm sure. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. A vow is a promise, isn't it? And, uh, you know, <clears throat> in the Lord's work, you know, you, you have times, and, uh, you know, you hear preachers say things like, you know, sometimes you never hear Pastor Carter say this, but, but I've heard preachers say things like, you know, I resign every Monday morning, that kind of thing, you know. 
and uh, that's never been a temptation for me, amen? And uh, even as a, as a teacher all these years, uh, I've had a basic philosophy when it comes to the classroom that, uh, that you experience most of the time, and uh, my philosophy is that if anybody in this room is going to be miserable, I can assure you it's not going to be me, amen? <laughs> and that works for me, but, <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> that is the most important thing in my life, the fact that I know that I'm in the center of God's will, the fact that I know that God has set me apart to be used of God. Now, there's been a lot of different applications of that over the years. And, uh, you know, and I'm being a little personal this morning, but as I said to you a while ago, there's a lot of things that you're asked or even told or just expected to do in the Lord's work that you didn't necessarily see coming. And, uh, but God always equips you to do the job. Some of it's fun. Some of it's not a whole lot of fun. Some of it's downright nasty stuff, you know, when you deal with situations and people and circumstances and so forth. And, uh, but it's all part of God's calling and God equips you to do the job and so I, I want to kind of focus that doctrine of sanctification in that perspective and uh, to be set apart for a sacred purpose to, to fulfill the perfect will of God for our lives I hope that that's something that that we all value as much as we value life itself this morning uh, in a personal way and uh, you know <clears throat> I forget who it was somebody in chapel or church the other day made a statement like this that uh, I think might have been Brother Travis the other day in chapel uh, about uh, if God had revealed to him at the time that he surrendered to the Lord all that that would entail, it would have scared the life out of him and he might not actually made the decision, you know, I think that's true for all of us. And uh, we, we, we often, uh, of course, think about it like this, you know, if, if there was a fellow that was just a, you know, a multi-zillionaire. And, uh, and he had a young son, you know, just a very young child, four, five, six years old. And, and the mother was out of the picture, and, and, uh, and, and you know, so that, that kid was that man's sole heir if, if he were to die today, you know. Then that man, if he was wise, and he probably was, uh, he, he would make arrangements, he would put some kind of a plan in place to where if something happened to him, uh, his, his son would be cared for, his son would be well educated, his son would, you know, have people that would, would take care of him and, and raise him and so on and so forth, whatever that all entails. And uh, what he wouldn't do is he wouldn't just set it up to where if I died today, my son gets it all, you know. My son gets my millions and billions of dollars or whatever, because a five-year-old kid, a six-year-old kid doesn't get that and would not value that. Uh, and, and most folks wouldn't value that the way they ought to at any age, much less at that age. And so he would probably arrange it to where, according to the legalities of the arrangement, when that kid got to a certain age, then, then of course, you know, he would be cared for all of his life, but, uh, but he couldn't just get that money and go out and blow it at Vegas or whatever, you know. Uh, he would... Uh, uh, he would be given it and, and given access to it in certain increments when hopefully he became uh, mature enough to handle that level of responsibility. And, uh, you know, a father that truly loved his son would set it up that way so the kid would be ruined and, and, and picked off by the vultures of society and so forth that go after people like that that have money. Now, if... Uh, kind of could correlate that back to what I'm talking about here about God's plan for our life. If we knew at the day we got saved or the day that we surrendered to the Lord all that that would encompass, you know, then, then uh, we probably would not value God's perfect will for our lives as we should because it would scare the life out of us, you know. And uh, I, I don't know what the Lord has in store for each and every one of you. I don't necessarily... Uh, know for certain what he has in store for me and I've been here a long time and uh, and I plan to be here until the trumpet sounds amen and uh, the Lord may have something different in mind I hope that if that is the case I'll be submissive to his direction and to his calling in my life I don't see that happening but God will move people and direct people as he sees fit and uh, you know the idea of course is that we value as we should the calling of God upon our lives. And uh, I've seen people 
sell out to the world and sell out to the devil so cheaply, even when it comes to what we're talking about this morning. Uh, I'll never forget, even this had, had nothing to do with a spiritual decision. In fact, it was a very uh, unspiritual decision. Uh, I remember one time when I was working as a teenager, working at McDonald's, and, and a guy, come, a, a girl come walking in the lobby, and uh, a good looking girl, you know, and, and she, she walked up to one of the fellows that I worked with who was there on the register, and, uh, and the guy walked off his job to go somewhere with that girl right then and there. And just, of course, you know, he couldn't come back to work. They needed him. And uh, you don't just do that, you know. If you're sick, you have a family emergency or something, sure, they work with you. But it was just about a girl, you know. He just told the assistant manager, I'm out of here. And, uh, <laughs> and I sat there and looked at the guy, and I thought, how, you know, how, how stupid is that, you know, to give up your job? After about 30 minutes, when she told him, you know, what she thought of him or whatever, he, he came back and wanted his job back. And the system manager just about whipped him in the back room and told him to get off the property and don't come back, as he should have. And uh, sometimes people uh, don't value the important things of life as they should. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All of that wasn't in my notes, so I won't charge any extra for that this morning. Amen? <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a fantastic passage of Scripture. The whole chapter is. So many wonderful verses here. And uh, I want you to focus on verse number uh, 18 and 19. You all know verse 17 we've talked about this morning. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now notice in, in verse 18 and 19, we're going to deal with the doctrine of reconciliation. That's number four, I believe it is, on your list. Reconciliation. Look at the passage first. And all things, verse 18, <clears throat> and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now there's a very important notion right there in that statement. Let me ask you a question this morning. Does God ever, in the history of eternity, <laughs> if there's such a thing as that, does God ever need to be reconciled to man? If I have a problem at home and my wife and I are out of sorts with each other, then more than likely I probably need to be reconciled to her more so than the other way around. Amen? But God never has that problem because God never fails. God never sins. God never messes up like we do. All right, so God never needs to be reconciled to man, but I got news for you. Man most certainly needs to be reconciled to God, doesn't he? That's what he's talking about here. To wit that God, verse 8, 18 again, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. It goes back to what we talked about the other day. God's love precedes our love. He reached out to us first. Amen? All right. Uh, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What's that all about? That's your soul winning right there. That's the fact that you can invite other people to trust Christ as their Savior so they, in turn, can be reconciled to God. Now, verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of of reconciliation. All right, so here we find the doctrine of reconciliation is found, of course, as is true of all these great doctrines, in Christ himself. And uh, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Let me give you a little definition for the word, for the doctrine of reconciliation. It's really quite simple. Reconciliation is to make peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, to make peace between two parties at odds with each other. To make peace between two parties at odds with each other. <coughs> to make peace between two parties at odds with each other. Now think about what sin has done to the human race. Sin, 
turns a holy and righteous God away from man. God will not put up with it. God will not tolerate sin in his presence. And so sin turns a holy and righteous God away from man. Sin causes man, in many cases, to despise God. And you get various levels of that when you're out there knocking doors. Some folks just, well, you know, I don't believe in a God like that. I, my God's a God of love. So they just rewrite the scriptures to suit what they believe. And uh, But there will come a day of reckoning in their lives, won't there? There will come that day of judgment. And, uh, and what they believe had better be the right thing at that point in time. And, uh, you know, and then you got people that curse you and slam the door in your face and all that kind of thing. And so uh, what a difference. God is outraged at man's sin. But he loves, the, he loves the sinner, does he? God is outraged at man's sin, but he loves the man. In fact, he loved him so much, he loves us so much, that God took the initiative by sending Christ to pay for our sins, or pay for man's sins. And, and as we've seen, of course, in these passages, Christ's death, uh, uh, what's the Bible word again? Propitiated or satisfied God's justice, making peace between a holy God and justified sinners. And uh, let's look at one more passage this morning and our time will be up uh, for today. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1. We see the doctrine of reconciliation clearly in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Here Paul writes and he says in verse 20, And having made peace... Through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. All right, comes back to the same basic thought we've been dealing with all morning. And such were some of you, Paul said to the church of Corinth. And uh, here to the church of Colossae, and you that were sometimes alienated. What's that mean? That means alienated from God in your sin. And enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. All right, let's put number five on your list there, and we'll start with it on Wednesday after our memory work. The next doctrine we're going to talk about is number five, the doctrine of redemption. Redemption. That's going to do it for this morning. Thank you. You are dismissed.